Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick little background on Ron Brown. After decades spent traveling the world and picking up university degrees from Jerusalem, Harvard, and Geneva, Dr. Ron Brown settled in New York City in 1992. He has been teaching history, ethnic studies, and political science at Toro College and world religions at the Unification Theological Seminary for over 25 years. He has been deeply involved in the cultural life of New York City through his work as a featured speaker at the New York Historical Society, New York Council for the Humanities, and numerous other libraries, historical societies, colleges, and universities. So we are very happy to welcome back Dr. Ron Brown. Take it away, Ron. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, welcome everybody to the Port Washington Library. So in keeping with this series, which I've been doing of the great cities of the world, today we're doing um, <clears throat> Tel Aviv. What did we do last time? Well, we did Istanbul, another fascinating city. And then in June, June 18th, uh, Again at noon, I'll be doing Angkor Wat, the great lost city of Cambodia. And then in July, July 9th, I will be talking about Amsterdam, which I'm sure a lot of you have visited. I won't be here in August because I am hoping to be able to continue my trip to Europe, as which I've done every year um, in August since I've uh, settled in New York. So. But then we will, I'll be back in September and uh, uh, be continuing with this uh, series on the great and exciting cities of the world. So our topic for today is Tel Aviv. And I'm sure a lot of you have been to Tel Aviv. So um, if you come up with any um, questions or comments, uh, use the chat line. Uh, you know that's at the three dots and just write in your chat comment or question uh, if you're afraid of forgetting it. And uh, I'll uh, take care of those um, when I finish. So what is our outline? Well, we will begin with the father of the modern Jewish state and the father of Tel Aviv. Then we'll talk a little bit about what inspired Theodor Herzl and his supporters to establish a brand new city uh, on the coast of the Mediterranean. And the Tel Aviv was more than just a new city. It also was a symbol of the new Jew that Theodor Herzl envisaged. Then the success of Tel Aviv, which was a proof that his vision of a Jewish nationalism would actually get off the ground. And then of course, the place everybody knows in uh, Tel Aviv, and that is the world of Diesengolf. Uh, Diesengolf, one of the, I think the very first mayor of uh, Tel Aviv. Whoops, we just went there. And then finally, we'll talk about the current state of Tel Aviv and um, what is going on in the city. So as usual, I'll talk for about 45, 50 minutes and then we'll throw it open to, uh, to the chat um, questions and comments and uh, I'll field any questions you may have. Okay, now I'm sure you've all heard of Theodore Herzl. Well, Theodore Herzl, is considered the father of the Jewish state. And in fact, his 1896 book was called The Jewish State Toward a Modern Solution to the Jewish Question. And there you see the bearded uh, Theodor Herzl, uh, who's buried in uh, Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem up on um, the mountain. And we see him standing there in his hometown. Now, he was a Viennese Jew, a journalist, who um, was a newspaper writer, a researcher, and traveled throughout Europe as a journalist, which meant he had exposure to uh, leading figures, controversial figures. He could travel all over with his uh, passport, which listed him as a journalist. 
Well, when his book was published uh, simultaneously in Leipzig in Germany and in Vienna in 1896, we see the German title, Der Judenstadt, Versuch einer modernen Lösung der Judenfrage. He was a lawyer, so he always took a very serious, legalistic, and concrete approach to everything. And his vision of a Jewish state was also very lawyer-oriented, uh, very rational, very well thought out, and put in a very solid context. Now, he is proposing a Jewish solution to the Jewish question. Well, first, what was the Jewish question he is referring to? It was the reality of the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD by the Romans following the Great Revolt. Well, the Romans, as you all well know, destroyed Jerusalem, expelled the Jewish population, and the picture you see on the right is actually in Rome, on a giant co column in the forum showing the victorious Roman soldiers going to Rome, carrying the famous candlestick of the temple along with the Ark of the Covenant and all of the other temple treasures, taking them to Rome as loot. So that began what we call the diaspora. In Hebrew, they call it the galut, which means the dispersal of the Jews around the world. Well, without the temple, of course, the Jews had to adapt. The temple was gone. Most of the priests were killed. The kings were no more. The elite was dispersed or slaughtered. And so Judaism entered a real crisis. How can you continue Jewish identity without the infrastructure of a government? You have no policemen, you have no army, you have no taxes, you have no priests, you have no temple. And so what we call synagogue Judaism emerged. The priests were replaced by rabbis. Animal sacrifice in the temple was replaced by studying the Torah. So a whole new form of Judaism emerged, and this was Judaism as a synagogue-oriented religious movement. The Torah was finally written down and the text which we use today was agreed upon. These are the five books so, uh, attributed to Moses, which are in every synagogue and are the basis of the synagogue worship. Hebrew, of course, had died out by the time of the Roman occupation of Jerusalem and uh, destruction of Jerusalem. But there were certain teachers who still remembered Hebrew and could read the Torah and translate it into Latin or Greek or Egyptian or um, Aramaic, which was the language of the Jews at the time. So the rabbis became scholars of a dead language and of an ancient book. Another pillar of synagogue Judaism was the holiday, the tradition whether it is Passover or in the New Year or the other Jewish holidays, they emerged into great importance because that was the time when you would gather in the synagogue, even if you weren't very um, uh, loyal to all of the religious rules and, and rituals, still a holiday <clears throat> always signifies food, fun, and getting together. So it bound the Jews in the diaspora together as a community. The more religious Jews kept to the kosher laws, which meant a whole infrastructure of food. I mean, you can't have a kosher butcher if you only have two families living in a town. So that encouraged the Jews to cluster in certain areas and to be able to support a kosher grocery store, a kosher slaughterhouse, and maintain a synagogue. So in the diaspora, <clears throat> Judaism became identified as a religion. 
when the Jews settled in a particular place, of course, they developed their own culture. You had the Yiddish speaking Jews of Eastern Europe. See the signs on the picture. This is from the Eldridge Street um, Synagogue and Museum where they have preserved all these signs in Yiddish. The different groups of Jews developed different languages, whether it was Yiddish or Ladino or Romaniot uh, in the Greek Jewish, they developed their own forms of clothing, their big um, expensive uh, wool hats or other types of turbans and uh, developed their own cultures. They continued to migrate around the world. The picture on the bottom left we see the Lower East Side, which in 1900 already hosted half a million Jews. Jews continued to expand. You had the Jews in Spain, the Jews in Babylon, the Jews of India, the Bukharian Jews of Central Asia. You had the Jews of the Russian Pale of Settlement in Austria and Hungary and Romania. Some Jews, of course, assimilated. They saw no reason to maintain these religious rituals. And like Jews today, especially Jews in America, were over 50% Mary non-Jews, and it's very easy to assimilate. You can change your name and move to a new place, and nobody would be the wiser. A lot of Jews identified themselves as either Greeks or Italians or Spaniards because they had very often a similar ethnic background and the similar facial features, black hair and whatnot. And so they could very easily assimilate. Well, Theodor Herzl argued that it was synagogue Judaism. It was the religion that preserved the Jews in the diaspora. Now, as Theodor Herzl was growing up and writing his book, The Judenstadt, Europe was very different than it is today. The, this, this map shows the Europe that Theodor Herzl knew. Eventually, Germany in the 1870s got united and the Kaiser was proclaimed the, the emperor of Germany. You had the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, where he was from. You had France under the kings and the Great Britain, and of course, the Great Russian Empire. So at Theodore Herzl's time, there were basically three great empires which ruled over 90% of the Jews of the world. The Russian Empire, the German Empire, and the Austrian Empire. So this is the Jewish world he knew. The Jews were a minority in the three great empires, as well as the Jews of Romania, of Turkey, of Palestine, of Egypt, of Italy, France, Great Britain, and there was a growing Jewish population in the United States. But these nice borders on this map show a very pleasant view of Europe. But lurking underneath these neat international borders, a lot was going on. And as a journalist, Theodor Herzl traveled throughout these three empires into France and Britain. And as a journalist, he listened. What is going on as Europe approaches the year 1900? Well, he was fully aware that the Russian Empire with the great czar in St. Petersburg ruled over the largest empire the world had ever seen. But all was not peaceful and calm uh, below the surface. If you look at the map, look at the very top, upper left-hand corner. There you see Norway and Sweden. Well, Finland was part of the Russian Empire. Well, you can be sure these proud Finns that speak a language that nobody else can ever learn were not thrilled being ruled by the Tsar, nor were the Poles. There was no Poland on the map and even Warsaw was controlled by the Russian Empire. 
Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia don't even appear on the map. Armenia and Georgia and the Caucasus and all of the hundreds of thousands of Jews in a Central Asia, Bukharia, Tajikistan, and these places were not thrilled being ruled by the Tsar. And they started agitating to establish an independent country. The Finns wanted to reestablish Finland as an independent country. The Poles were revolting every weekend to get rid of the Germans, the Russians, and the Austrians and reconstitute the great Polish empire of the Middle Ages. And so all was not calm and peaceful in the Russian empire. Same thing in the Austrian empire. Hungarians were not thrilled to be ruled by these damn Austrians. The Czechs and the Slovaks were not at all thrilled with being ruled by Vienna. Large areas of Northern Italy were also controlled or periodically conquered by the Austrians. Transylvania, today part of Romania, was not thrilled with the Austrians. And then there were the Croats and the Slovenes and the Bosnians. None of these people were very happy being ruled by Vienna, and they started demanding independent states as the early years of the 1900s started unraveling. Same thing was going on in the great German Empire, which ruled over a big chunk of Poland, had taken a big chunk of Denmark, even Alsace-Lorraine, you can see on the map, had been in the German eyes, liberated and reunited with the German Empire. Well, neither the Poles nor the Danes, and some would even say the Alsatians and the people from Lorraine were very happy living under the German Kaiser. All of these peoples in the years leading up to World War I were demanding independent countries. There were millions of Hungarians in the area which is today Hungary, and they said, we want an independent country. Well, one of the big problems that confronted Herzl was he said, yes, all of this nationalism is rising all over Europe. The German, the Austrian, and the Russian empires are built on a very unstable foundation. But Herzl, as a Jew, a non-practicing Jew, and an anti-religious Jew, highly secularized Jew, still he was a Jew. And he realized that the Jews scattered from one end of Europe to the other were also a major nationality. But the problem was they were scattered in communities from the middle of Russia down to Portugal and from Great Britain down to Egypt and Ethiopia. There was no one geographic area that the Jews could say, we are a majority here and we want independence. So that was the problem, the Jewish problem that Theodor Herzl wanted to solve. Now you look at the, uh, uh, the list on the, on the left, you can see that there were about 3 million Jews in what is today the Polish area, divided up back then between the Germans, the Russians, and the Austrians. Well, in 1914, as we all know, the world went up in flames. And this was the famous First World War. During this war, three great empires collapsed. The Austrian Empire, the German Empire, and the Russian Empire. A fourth one also collapsed, and that was the Ottoman Turkish Empire, which had a very large population of Jews and which also ruled over the historic Palestine. So we can say the four great empires of the world collapsed. 
And from the rubble emerged all of these new countries who had for decades, if not a hundred years, been agitating for independence. You see on the map, there's a, Finland is on the map again. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, there's a brand new Poland there. Bohemia, Moravia, the Czech area, Slovakia, where my grandfather's family is from, is on the map again. There's a big Romania. There's a new country called Yugoslavia. There's a Hungary. Bulgaria is independent. So World War I shattered the old world. Russia collapsed. Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Finland got their independence and the Tsar was overthrown and killed and Russia became the USSR. But once again, the millions of Jews in Europe are nowhere to be found. There's no map that shows a Jewish state, once again, because the Jews were scattered everywhere. Well, unfortunately, following World War I, which ended in 1918, the Peace Treaty of Versailles in 1919 and 1920, the signers of the Peace Treaty and the leaders and the intellectuals of all of these new countries realized that they had large populations who were not Polish, or they were Polish Jews or Yiddish speaking Jews, the Jews of the USSR, Romania, Hungary, Germany, were minorities in these brand new countries. So the League of Nations, the forerunner of the United Nations, which established after World War I, convinced all these new countries that suddenly appeared on the map to sign minority protection treaties, which meant that the Jews in Poland or Lithuania or Romania were guaranteed religious freedom. They were given language freedom so they could have their own schools, their yeshivas in their own Yiddish language. They could buy land and build synagogues. They could have their religious courts which would rule on matters of divorce and uh, family issues. They were guaranteed the right to vote in national elections. They were allowed to buy and sell land. They were allowed to be elected to public office. They were given in equality before the law. So there was no discrimination between Jews or Catholics or Orthodox or anybody else. Forced conversion was outlawed and certain areas were given the right to vote. Which country do you want to become a part of? Well, this looked very great on paper, but it didn't amount to much more than a piece of paper. Because as soon as the Poles got their new country back, they were out to restore Polish greatness. And they said, well, if you wanna live in Poland, you have to learn Polish. You should go to the Polish public school system. You should get out of the ghetto and join in Polish society. Now, of course, a lot of Poles said, no, they're not even Poles. They should simply get out. So following World War I, when all these big countries got their independence, restored their national languages and all of that, the Jews, were even more brutally persecuted. Pogroms in Russia gave way to the communists who were no great lovers of Jews either. And of course, we know that the, by the uh, First World War, anti-Semitism had risen to such a pitch that the Nazis built their entire political movement on the ethnic cleansing of Germany. And it was not only getting rid of just Jews, but of gypsies, of gays, of Poles, of anybody who was not ethnically German. So six million Jews were ended up being um, exterminated. Well, Theodor Herzl, while this was going on, he foresaw that the status of the Jews following World War I was not going to improve. 
He even predicted that the leaders of these countries which wanted their national independence would have no love for the Jews. And so the Jewish destiny was catastrophic, according to him. So when on May 14th, 1948, the Jewish state was established, they clearly recognized that it was Theodor Herzl's predictions of a Holocaust that proved to be true. Well, Theodor Herzl was not, um, as I said, not a religious Jew. I mean, he had never studied Hebrew much and uh, never went to synagogue. I mean, he was as secular as anybody else, a great lover of Wagner's operas, a connoisseur of opera and ballet and everything else. Well, his view of who is a Jew was radically different from that of the traditional synagogue. The traditional synagogue said the rock upon which the Jewish people stand is their religion, their covenant with God. Whereas Theodor Herzl said, no, the Jews are a nation, just like the Poles and the Germans and the Lithuanians and the Japanese and the Chinese. A Jew is a nationality, and religion has nothing to do with it. If you're celebrating Passover, it has nothing to do with God. It is simply part of the Jewish history, just like the American Revolution or the French Revolution were part of our national histories. So he said the Old Testament should be taken as just a history book. So he said and set out to establish the new Jew, the Jew that would reject all of the God talk and all of the religion talk and all of this kind of stuff. And he wanted to reestablish the Jewish people as a national group. Of course, most importantly, was the restoration of the national language which under Ben Yehuda was achieved. Now, of course, Herzl uh, uh, never thought, uh, never spent his time learning this new national language, but he said that this is part of a national identity. Spanish have Sp uh, Sp Spain has Spanish, Portugal has Portuguese, Japan has Japanese, uh, and France has French. So the Jews should have a restored Hebrew language. He said they should leave Eastern Europe, gather together, and eventually decided that historic Palestine was to be their national home, although he was offered areas in Africa and Australia, but he said, no, the historic bond is with the historic Palestine. He studied Jewish history, resurrected national pride, Masada had nothing to do with religion. It was a sign of Jewish resistance against Roman domination. It was a battle that was part of the history. And he called for the end of the diaspora. Once again, way back in the 1880s, predicting that the Jewish future in Eastern Europe, as well as Central Europe, was bad. It would end in disaster, and so the Jews should get out while the getting was good. So basically, he rejected 2,000 years of Jewish history, saying, get rid of rabbis, get rid of synagogues, get rid of these pasty skin Jews with their funny curls and funny hats sitting in a yeshiva studying books in an ancient dead language. He said, go to college, get an education, restore the Hebrew language, become an engineer, become a journalist. In fact, create the new Jew. And here again, this was part and parcel of the identity of the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Restore Poland to its historic greatness. Restore Hungary to its ancient greatness. And restore the Jews to their ancient greatness. 
Now, this same um, mentality was uh, arising even among the African Americans, where the survey graphic published in Harlem said Harlem was the mecca of the new Negro. Get rid of the slave past, get rid of poverty and ignorance, and create the new Negro in the new Negro city of Harlem. Booker T. Washington is accredited with the first person who used the phrase, a new Negro. And here you see his book, A New Negro for a New Century. The New Negro and Interpretation by the great poet Alan Locke, once again, recreating a people who had been dominated for centuries. Well, the same spirit was animating Germany between the two world wars. Weimar Germany overthrew the uh, Kaiser. The world was changing. New inventions, the telephone, the radio were emerging as means of communications. People were aware already at the end of World War I that a new world was coming into being. Even the communists believed that they were going to create a utopia here on Earth. The Roaring Twenties exploded the past, rejected the past, and said, let's go into the future. And so what Theodor Herzl was preaching was very much in harmony with the thinking of the age. Now, of course, Theodor Herzl's vision of the new Jew aroused fierce opposition. The Orthodox Jews, vast majority of them said, no, 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 no. We're not supposed to go back to Palestine and create a new state. This is the job of the Messiah. We are supposed to suffer in the diaspora for our sins. Until the Messiah comes, he will cause the Jews to return to their ancient homeland and he will rule as their king. Even the reform Jews of Germany, Western Europe, and the United States viciously opposed Theodor Herzl. And the Pittsburgh platform, um, the first platform of American reform Judaism, wrote, we consider ourselves no longer a nation. Take that, Theodor Herzl. We are not a nation. We are a religious community. We do not expect to go back to the deserts of Palestine. We are 100% Americans. And so Theodor Herzl was rejected by the Orthodox Jews who opposed him as being an atheist and trying to take over the role of the Messiah. He was viciously opposed by the Reform Jews, especially American Reform Jews, who said, we don't want to go to Palestine. We are 100% loyal Americans, and we are living our lives here. So fierce opposition to Theodore Herzl's vision. Now, Theodore Herzl needed to prove to the world and to his fellow Jews that his vision of a new Jew and a restored national state in Palestine was feasible. It was possible. Well, the first Jews from Europe, inspired by Theodore Herzl even before he wrote his famous book, started building a new neighborhood just north of Jaffa, on the Mediterranean. And they called it Tel Aviv. Tel in uh, Arabic and Hebrew means a mound or a hill. And Aviv, of course, is spring, like the name Aviva. So it was the hill of spring. And it was a new spring for a new people in a new land. Well, the first settlers settled there in 1887, and it gradually began to grow. 
When the British took over Palestine after World War I, they encouraged Jewish migration to this new city, and it was recognized as a township in 1921. And finally, in 1934, it was recognized as an independent city by the British. So here you see some of the old postcards. I mean, it doesn't look like Tel Aviv today, small houses, uh, sandy streets, but you can see the, um, the Mediterranean in the distance. Well, Herr Theodor Herzl's vision of the new Jew in the new land was totally secular. He firmly followed in the American pattern of total separation of church and state, meaning synagogue had nothing to do with Tel Aviv. In fact, he even opposed building a synagogue in Tel Aviv, saying it reminded the Jews of the diaspora and their subservience to other people. Well, Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel after independence, was a great follower of Theodor Herzl, totally secular, and in fact, like Herzl, even anti-religious, saying the rabbis were keeping people ignorant and that they should get out of the synagogues, get careers, become engineers, and become modern people, join the modern world. The famous line attributed to Ben-Gurion, nobody can prove if he said this, but he said, when Israel has Hebrew-speaking prostitutes walking the streets of Tel Aviv, then we will be a nation just like all the others. And so this new city came into existence. It was viciously anti-religious. It was totally secular, even socialist and viciously nationalist. Look at the picture on the right from the uh, independence celebration, the Israeli flag. But then you see all the red flags because they were socialists. They were revolutionaries. Yeah, and look at the way they're dressed. The girls are wearing shorts. You don't see any yarmulkes or anything religious. It was to be a secular um, utopia. The major party that emerged under Ben-Gurion was what we call labor Zionism. It was anti-religious. It was totally secular. And that's what Tel Aviv was. Look at the pictures here on the middle. That was Herzl's vision of the new country. Tractors, girls in blouses and shorts, young people going off learning Hebrew, speaking Hebrew together, farming, building new cities. Look at on the right, another Independence Day celebration. I mean, uh, it is the victory of Herzl's secular dream. In fact, when we talk about the early settlers, uh, they, you, they adopted the name Sabra. Sabra is a prickly pear cactus. And if anybody has ever tried to pick one of the fruits off of the cactus, you know it is covered with spikes and you can really hurt your hand. But once you open it up and you peel it, it's a very sweet and nice fruit inside. That's what they adopted as their motto. We are as nationalistic as the Germans, as the Chinese, as the Japanese, as the Americans. We are as proud of our national language as the French or the Germans or anybody else. So the model for the new state was Western Europe, separation of church and state as they had in the United States, secularism as they had in France no religious part to the state at all. Of course, when you restore the national language, you're going to have to have a theater and a whole literature. So the Habima Theater opened in 1912, where they not only wrote new plays in Hebrew, but they translated the great literature of the world. The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky and the poster. 
all of the great writers were translated into this new language and plays were performed. In fact, I it's, uh, read in one account that a lot of the new immigrants who still only spoke Yiddish or another language would go to the theater just to be surrounded by the Hebrew language, which they were still learning. The Palestine um, Symphony Orchestra, established in 1936, later renamed the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. On the right, you see the new orchestra um, headquarters in Tel Aviv. And the picture on the left shows Leonard Bernstein conducting the orchestra. And you see everybody wrote their, signed their names in Hebrew. Looking at that, I mean, I can pick out the names uh, written in Hebrew um, by someone who barely could write in Hebrew. So some of these signatures look like they're written by someone in first grade. In fact, that's the way I write Hebrew. People always say I write Hebrew like I was in third grade because it's not my first language and it's not the uh, English I write very fast and everything, but you can recognize the difference in signatures. So Herzl's vision of a totally secular city started attracting a lot of followers. It was a city of the future, embracing the future, the best in classical music, the best in literature. And until today, Tel Aviv is always a hundred miles ahead of everybody else. It had the very first Tel Aviv gay pride parade. And until today, when you celebrate New Year's, of course, the Western New Year's on January 1st, you go to Tel Aviv, gay pride in Tel Aviv. So it is a city which until today has him looking toward the future. Now the place where everybody goes is of course Diesengolf. Diesengolf, one of the first mayors, maybe even the first mayor of Tel Aviv. You see Diesengolf circle and this is sort of um, what Tel Aviv looks like today. Big open boulevards, circles with parks in them. And when you walk up and down Diesengolf and going to cafes and bars and clubs, I mean, you could be in Miami, you could be in Marseille or one of the other <clears throat> very modern secular cities um, on the coast. And it has remained loyal to its secular origins as uh, planned by um, Theodor Herzl. Even the architecture reflected the future. In fact, there are entire conferences and books devoted to the latest in German architecture of the 1920s and 30s, and that was the Bauhaus. These ultra modern buildings, no references to the Middle East, no references to the Bible, no references to religion, but the ultimate in modern streamline living. I mean, you could almost expect to see the Guggenheim Museum from Fifth Avenue. It could be plopped down in the middle of Tel Aviv and nobody would blink an eye because that's the type of ultra modern forward-looking architecture that Tel Aviv embodies. It's not looking towards the Middle East. It's not looking towards the past. It's not looking toward religion. It is looking toward the future. In fact, this Bauhaus is often referred to as the Zionist architecture. Once again, reflecting the Oriental type architecture, um, that you see in the top of the book, uh, on the cover of the book, but it is the pictures on the left, big balconies, white, no decorations, uh, very um, Corbusier, very Frank Lloyd Wright style of architecture. The University of Tel Aviv was founded in 1953 uh, and once again, a very forward-looking university. 
uh, technology and science and uh, very, very secular in orientation um, and very often viewed as the Israeli Harvard University. Jerusalem has the pedigree and it was the, um, um, the oldest um, Jewish university in the country, but Tel Aviv was the very future looking Tel Aviv. Silicon Valley, of course, is located in Tel Aviv. This is in Herzliya and uh, up in the north. The, they call it the Silicon Wadi. Wadi is an Arabic word, which they also use in modern Hebrew, uh, which simply means a valley. But a wadi is a dry river valley that only flows with water in the rainy season. So that's what a wadi is. But they call it the Silicon Wadi, uh, high technology. Um, uh, a lot of the most famous hackers um, uh, that are constantly causing problems uh, are trained in the Silicon Wadi. Uh, and so this is where the modern, uh, most forward looking communications technology computers uh, um, uh, are all uh, located in Tel Aviv. Now there was a synagogue that was permitted to be built and this is called the, um, the Great Synagogue. Um, and uh, it, you can see it on the left, it hearkened back to a more Byzantine religious type architecture with the dome on the top. And so that was one of the few buildings that um, um, introduced religion into Tel Aviv, but even that was considered a bit too um, churchy looking. And so on the right, you see what it looks like today. It was eventually covered over with a bit more modern um, uh, outer um, curtain to make it blend in with Tel Aviv um, as a whole. To the south of Tel Aviv is, of course, the city of Jaffa. Jaffa was one of the cities that was cleaned out by a mixture of refugees fleeing, and uh, the last of them were expelled uh, to the Gaza Strip. But Jaffa is still a city of churches. It was predominantly Christian. And so you see the monasteries, the church towers, the bell towers and stuff, which have added sort of a new element to um, Tel Aviv because following the War of Independence, um, Jaffa and, uh, uh, was, uh, was annexed by Tel Aviv. So now very often when you look at maps, you see it's Tel Aviv Jaffa um, because it is now one um, combined city. But a great place for restaurants. You see the old monasteries and churches and uh, um, Catholic schools and everything, which have been turned into restaurants and uh, clubs and bars and uh, discos. B'nai Brak was founded in 1924. And that was a special settlement for Orthodox Jews. And immigrants would go, and as you can see, the uh, set up their homes. And you can see on the left, you, know, you even see the camels uh, and the um, small houses with the sandy streets. And it grew and grew, and it is today almost an exclusively um, Orthodox town. On the right, you see one of the big um, yeshivas, which is in B'nai Brak but they very much exist as two separate cities. I mean, walking around downtown Dizengoff, I mean, um, the Orthodox are not going to go there because they're not gonna to wanna to see girls in mini shorts and halter tops and guys in tank tops and listening to wild music and see gay and lesbian couples strolling around hand in hand. So Tel Aviv retains its very secular um, personality. Well, Theodor Herzl's dream came to a screeching halt. 
And this was the Yom Kippur War of 1973. I lived in Jerusalem for five years and I was there during the Yom Kippur War. And of course, like Theodore Herzl himself, I'm a historian and a writer, so I traveled all over the country. And uh, as the book by Harold B Howard Bloom says, the eve of destruction. The Yom Kippur War is the first and the only war that Israel came very close to losing. And I remember during the war, I would go to parties and go to Tel Aviv and sit on Diesengulf, and it was filled with American soldiers, Air Force pilots, naval personnel, who had been dispatched to keep Israel from being destroyed. Well, the Yom Kippur War was such a traumatic experience for Israel that the people rejected the Labor Party. Golda Meir was forced to resign. Moshe Dayan was fired. And the whole labor, Zionist labor movement, was rejected. Menachem Begin, with the Likud party and the support of the religious groups, managed to get power. And as the book by Daniel Gordis says, the battle for Israel's soul. Menachem Begin, who was an extremely right wing, almost atheist, anti religious, but he wanted political power. So he made an alliance with the religious parties. And uh, uh, when you'd meet with them, he'd put on a yarmulke and pretend to be religious, but he knew that he needed their support if he was going to control the country. Very much like Donald Trump realizes he can only survive with the support of the ultra right wing evangelical Christians. And so Israel started abandoning the vision of Theodore Herzl, of a nation just like any other, a secular country equal to Germany or France or England. And Israel, under Menachem Begin from 77 to 83, began to turn religious. At the same time, you had the rise of modern Orthodox Judaism, where the Orthodox, who had opposed political Zionism of Herzl and Ben Gurion and Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan, suddenly began to realize that if they got political power, then they could start forcing the country to abandon its secular origins and become a religious state. There's a whole literature on religious Zionism. When you go to Israel, you see the picture of the guys on the right. These are very often young guys, very militant. Uh, uh, you see the strings and the t-shirts and the yarmulkes, the knitted yarmulkes is what they um, uh, um, uh, prefer. And with Menachem Begin and then later subsequent uh, prime ministers uh, such as um, Ariel Sharon and now Met uh, Netanyahu, the two big movements sponsored by the religious right went into overdrive. Settlements, the West Bank and East Jerusalem and Gaza were no longer bargaining chips to be bargained away for peace but they were to be annexed. And secularism was rejected and religious Zionism took over. On the right, you see the new orthodoxy uh, guys uh, building West Bank settlements, uh, expanding into the West. This is very much in the news these days, um, uh, uh, once again, uh, as I speak. And so, a lot of literature was written that the Zionists under Herzl and Ben Gurion and these people um, were was being rejected, and it was not just might and power that had built the state that had won the '67 war, had had built Tel Aviv that was important, but it was religious Zionism which was going to take over. 
Well, the switch of secular countries to religious identities is not just something that happened in Israel. It began even before the Yom, um, Yom Kippur War. For example, you had the Islamic Revolution in Iran, where the very secular Shah of Iran was overthrown, the Americans were expelled, and it became a theocracy. Below that, you see the rise of the BJP, the Hindu Nationalist Party, rejecting the secularism of the founders of independent India and turning it into a Hindu republic. I was in Goa and Mumbai um, a couple of years ago on vacation. And I mean, I visit churches and mosques and they were scared to death because they say the Hindus are now arming themselves and they're getting, they want to make it an ethnically and religiously pure Hindu country. And Muslims and Christians and Jews were being persecuted and expelled. In the middle, you see Vladimir Putin's loving symbol, the atomic bomb rocket merging with the Orthodox Church. In the United States, the same thing, beginning with Ronald Reagan and then going through to Donald Trump, the marriage between evangelical Christianity and the United States, rejecting the separation of church and state, which had been so powerful since the founding of the United States, which had inspired Theodore Herzl, being rejected. Confucianism in China, the evangelical Christians in Brazil, Ethiopia, Mexico. In fact, the civil war in Ethiopia is being fought between the evangelical Christians under the new president and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So it is a return to the unity of church and state, which is what is happening today as I speak. Now, how did that affect Tel Aviv? Well, the last time I was in Tel Aviv a couple of years ago, what really shocked me was the fact that even Diesengulf is beginning to look rather shabby. And I was talking to some people and they said, that's because the new government under Netanyahu is funneling all the money into West Bank settlements and new neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. And Tel Aviv, with all of its secularism, is being neglected. So as Jerusalem expands into the West Bank and new settlements are being built, Tel Aviv is being forgotten because it reminds so many people of the secular origins which they are trying to forget. Here we see the um, light pink areas where the majority of the Palestinians are forced to live. On the right is the hotel I stayed in, in Bethlehem. And you see the Bethlehem wall. The entire town of Bethlehem is surrounded by these walls with soldiers and the Palestinians are forced to live inside. It's a very famous hotel. It's called the Walled Off Hotel as a museum of the, um, the city of Bethlehem and the history of the wall. So that Israel of today has turned its back on the vision of Theodore Herzl, the secular, modern, youthful, Western looking city of Tel Aviv and the new Orthodox, the Likud party, Netanyahu once again restoring religion as the centerpiece of Israeli society and Israeli identity. And the split down the middle is very explosive in Israel um, uh, today between the ultra-religious and the even more radically ultra-secular. Now, I found that most of my Tel Aviv friends, the ultra-secular ones, 
have pretty well given up. And uh, in fact, the vast majority are now living here in New York City. New York is the second largest Israeli city in the world after Tel Aviv. So Tel Aviv began as a great vision reflecting the secular, modern, forward-looking values of the 1900s, a rise of nationalism, restoration of ancient cultures. But that all collapsed during the Yom Kippur War, and now his vision is largely forgotten, except by those dedicated Tel Avivians and a whole new sense of Israeli identity, which places a high value on religion has taken its place. So, picture on the right is me in my apartment in Jerusalem. That's what I looked like when I was in my early 20s. And I did my MA in modern history at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and I lived there for five years, and that's where I was during the um, Yom Kippur War. And that's the, on the left, that's a little bit more of what I look like um, um, today. 